Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, it's an awesome honor and privilege to be uh, with you uh, on this wonderful morning. Yes, it is a little wet, but I'm glad I'm here, and it's a pleasure. Listen, I want to give God thanks for your pastor, Pastor Bob. He's an incredible man of God, and um, listen, one of those people I just love, I'm just thanking God that I got to meet, and I, I, every time I'm with him, I, I take stuff all his ideas, all the things he's thinking, I take them. Uh, he, he has so much wisdom, and I don't even, I'm not even ashamed to even say that. Uh, so, you know, the other thing is, let me just get this out the way. I am a Jets fan. So, <laughs> I recognize, I recognize that I'm not in the green country, but we're up here in Bill's country. That's all right. And, 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 and that should also explain to you how much of a man of faith I am and how much patience I do have as a Jet fan. The other thing, listen, I came in about uh, 10, 10.30 last night, 11 o'clock, got to the hotel, and I'm starving. And um, I asked a guy uh, if there's any place that's open, because it looked like there's a lot of things that were closed, and at that point, I, I would take a taquito from 7-Eleven if I had to. <laughs> and um, he told me, listen, there's this place, and uh, well, no, no, they're a little expensive, but I'm sure they still deliver. So let me tell you something. I went... They delivered this, this place called Jack's. <laughs> I live just a couple of minutes, I live a couple of minutes outside of, of, of Manhattan, so if I want something cool and something to eat, I have all these restaurants to choose from. But let me tell you, as a New Yorker, I have never had barbecued wings with ribs like this in my life. <laughs> I felt the presence of God in the hotel room last night. It was amazing. And the coleslaw and the macaroni, it was like all oh, like real homemade. And so listen, if there are times throughout me preaching that I start, I kind of daze off a bit, it's not, the, it's not the spirit of God. Chances are it is Jack's, all right? So I'm putting that out there just so that you, 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 you know, just full disclosure. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to read a passage of scripture because there are times, especially as a believer, there are things that we uh, experience, things that we go through, I mean, seasons in our lives, and, and a lot of times we immediately want to say that because we're Christians, it's going to be all right. And, and, and even if it is a storm, even if there's a difficulty, even if it's a difficult season, it's got to be okay because I'm a child of God. In fact, as a Christian, you shouldn't go through bad times at all. In fact, as a child of God, because he loves you so much, everything will work out always just fine all the time. And the worst thing that can ever happen is for that not to be the case, especially as a believer. There are times that we actually experience storms. We go through storms. We go through things in our lives. And, and today I just want to share with you something that happened in Mark chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 35. It says, on that day... Jesus, when, he, when evening came, Jesus said to them, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea? obey him. See, my, my first point is uh, Jesus calls. You know, there, there, there are times in our lives where, where the calling of God will be there, and he calls you to go to the other side. Just like in this passage here, he, after a day of ministry, he gets the guys over, and he says, listen, guys, I'm going to take you to a place that we, we're not at right now. I'm, let's come with me and I will take you to the other side. Let's, let's go on this journey. We're going to come from where we are and now go to someplace new. 
And I don't know about you, this could be anything. You could just um, uh, enter into this relationship with Jesus Christ, and now you're embracing salvation. Well, guess what? You're going from here into this new place to the other side. Or maybe you, you, you have been saved for a bit, and now you're, you're, you're beginning to enter into a place of serving and learning how to give of yourself and, 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 and take steps into ministry. Well, that's, that's also too. He's, he's taking you. It's, you're embracing the call of God. Or maybe you're, you're reading the Word of God, and now all of a sudden, it's like the Word of God is starting to open up to you in new ways, and now you want to get deeper in. Well, it's the call of God. Jesus calls you to, to go to the next side. And so years ago, years ago in my ministry, I was, pre, I, I was pastoring uh, since 97, and right around 2002, 2003, uh, God started to do something new in my life. And, and to be honest with you, it, it really came about because of tragedy. You know, something tragic happened in our church. There was some sort of failure there, and I didn't respond the way I should have responded. In fact, I responded in a very critical way, and it was at that point the Lord revealed to me, like in my life, that I lacked this thing called agape love. When I would preach and when I would teach, I preach and taught in a way that you better get it right because I put a lot of work in this sermon. I put a lot of work in this lesson. You better not screw this up. You better, you better get this. And if you did happen to fail, oh, my gosh, it was such wrath. And God brought me to a place, this is not what, I, this, this is not what it is. And I, I never forget, I, I fasted for, for the entire week, and, and I came upon 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I, I was confronted with this thing called love. Isn't that cool to discover love after you become a Christian? And, 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 and I discovered it, and it just changed my life. It rearranged everything in my ministry and I embraced the call of God afresh. And I said, Lord, whatever you want, whatever you want to do, then so be it. And so it just so happened, right around that same time, we decided to plant a church in West Hempstead, Long Island. And we planted a church, we got a building, and God was doing some incredible things. And not only that, around that same time also, as God is calling me to do this, we just bought a house in Brooklyn, New York, and now everything is going great. Do you know how awesome it feels to be following God and everybody likes you and you got money? <laughs> like when ministry is working out and everything is great. And so here's the thing. My wife and I, we were trying to start a family, and, 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 and so, you know, the, the doctor said, guess what, um, you, you won't be able to have any children. And I was like, oh, you know, it's, but then, you know, when a doctor tells you that, you kind of deal with it or whatever. But in this season where God is calling us to come to the other side, I mean, the church is booming, we're growing, uh, we have a house, I got money, and my wife is pregnant. I'm like, oh, Jesus, this is, Yes! Ministry is great when everything is working out. I'm being honest with you. In fact, life is great. And everything is going well. But the Bible says in this passage that as Jesus called them to come, come to the other side, the Bible says a fierce wind, a gale, came out of nowhere. And it started to blow. And, and when, when, when the wind started to blow, the, 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 the waves started to get more violent and the water started being blown into the boat. And so the thing that was outside the boat is all good, but once the water starts getting into the boat, now it's a situation. And the disciples, you know, some of them being fishermen, they know what it's like to be on a boat. They're starting to get, you know, a little uh, scared, and, 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 and they're wondering what's going on. And so you can imagine as more water is getting into the boat, they're becoming a little bit more anxious. Now you can, they're grabbing the, the, the bucket, get the bucket, and they're pouring the water out. They're trying to save themselves. They're starting to make a lot of noise. There's chaos all over the place. And they come on, hurry up, we're going to die. And in the midst of all of this, they turn around, and they look at Jesus, and the Bible says, Jesus is sleeping in the stern on a cushion. I love the Word of God. It's so specific. And God can choose whatever he puts there. He chooses what to say. He's in control. Listen to what the Word of God says. In the midst of all this chaos where people think they're going to die, when people think this is it, the, the one person who should be in a position of authority to say, everybody come, the Bible says Jesus was fast asleep in the back part of the boat, wait, on a cushion in the midst of that chaos. And, and here's the verse that I want to bring to your attention, and I love to say it in the King James Version. The, the, the disciples, after all of this going on, and they're trying to stuff, the, the disciples came to him and said, Carest thou not that we perish? Carest Thou not, don't you care 
that we feel like we're about to die. Listen, my wife was pregnant and everything was going great until one day I heard a scream in the bathroom. And she runs out and she says, I think there's something wrong with the baby. We already set up the baby room. We got the colors out. We're already putting stuff together. And while, while, while that's how I rushed to the hospital, and when we get to the hospital, we see the doctor. The doctor comes out, and the doctor says, guess what? Uh, we don't think the baby's going to make it. I say, well, not my Jesus. Not my Lord. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He loves me. This, no, I, no, not so, not so. And so we went back. I, I went back and we started praying and we were fasting. We we're seeking God. We said, let's, Lord, come on, God, give me something, Lord. This ain't going to happen after all. We've given up just to be in your work. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. The baby died. To see the heart monitor no longer move, to see, to see you know, when, you, when, you, when you're looking at the picture, you see that little thing flickering. And all of a sudden, darkness, nothing. Carest thou not that we perish? Why would God allow this to happen now after you've I've already embraced your calling to come on over? I gotta be honest with you, I was I was angry. I was very angry. Um, depression set in, anger. Sadness. I felt myself pulling away from my family. And you know, when you do all this, you, you, you're still a pastor. You still got to preach. You still got to teach. Do you know what it's like? Do you know what it's like to speak life in others' lives while you're dying? Do you know what it's like for me to pray for healing for somebody else? They get healed and my baby die? Do you know what it's like to, to, to counsel a marriage that gets better while yours is falling apart? Do you know what it's like to serve week in and week out in Sunday school and kids' ministry and other people's kids are finding God and yours is drifting away? Carest thou not that we perish? And as I seek God as a spiritual believer, I turn around in the midst of all this chaos and he's sleeping on a pillow? I felt the depression f filling up the boat. I felt the anger. I felt the, 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 the distance now between ministry and myself and, and my wife and my, my family. I just, I, it was too much. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't put it all together. In the scripture, the Bible says, when they said this to Jesus, uh, Jesus, the Bible says, he got up and then he went and he rebuked the wind, and spoke to the waves, to the waters. And that word rebuke in the Greek, it, it, it simply means to be in a position of authority that you can now give commands. And there's confidence that that command will be heard and it will be followed. That's, he was sleeping. He got up and commanded everything to stop and to cease. I can say that I remember just praying to God, Lord, you could snap your finger, my baby will be back. You could snap your, your finger, and this is all good. Not, I promise you, God, I, I, I won't leave ministry. I Care us down not. When he did that, something struck me. He has the power to do this. See, my first point was Jesus calls. The second point was Jesus sleeps. The third point is Jesus rebukes. He begins to speak in a way that changes everything. With, with me, it happened in a, in a weird way um, because after losing my child, uh, we, we had tried the whole adoption thing, and it just, I just tried. I just couldn't deal with it, and people getting all up in my business and fingerprinting and classes. I, I just, I, I can't. I, I wanted my own child. I, just, I said, no, I can't do it. And so I bought a dog. His name is Mr. Beans. And then we got a cat, Miss Penelope. And I was totally happy. 
I have a family, and whatever, God, you, you, this is how it's going to be, then so be it, and I'm just going to keep preaching and do what I got to do. But I got, I got to be honest with you, there's still some stuff there, and I'll just find with my... And so here's what happened. This is how Jesus began to speak with authority in my life. One day, I heard news coverage in New Jersey, a woman who was a, a, a foster parent, she had two boys, and all she did was feed them peanut butter and applesauce so that she can take most of the money for herself. And the youngest boy died, malnourishment. And instead of alerting the authorities, she took the body and put it in her freezer in the basement. When I heard this, I got so angry. I don't, I mean, in, in hindsight, I'm thinking maybe because I just lost my child, and maybe I'm trying to have one, you're killing them. And so something in me just kind of just went nuts. And that Sunday, boy, I went to church, and boy, I was hopped up. I said, oh, if there's anybody in this world that should be taking care of the fatherless and the widow, it should be the Christians. It should be that I went in, preaching with fire and brimstone. So, man, we got money. We got rooms in our homes. We got to do something. It was good stuff, man. Moving about it. And so then that Tuesday, I'm in my office and I get a phone call. I said, Hello, yes. Is this Reverend Delmatch? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Oh, but it's come to our attention that you are interested in foster care. And I know how I feel about foster care already. Right? Like, no, no. And immediately, right then, the Holy Spirit said, if there's anybody in this world that should be taking care of the foreigners and the fiddles. I'm like, oh. And I could hear the Holy Spirit say, listen, if you say no, if you say no, you shouldn't expect anyone ever to listen to you or believe anything you said. You're a straight-up hypocrite. If you say no, and I said, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, oh, wonderful, sir, oh, this is wonderful, so this is what you're going to have to do, eight weeks of training, we're going to have the New York State come in and do inspection in your house, and you're going to have fingerprinting, and you'll be on a registry, I'm like, <laughs> come, let's go over to the other side. And it's at that moment I'm starting to realize that sometimes the storms that occur in our lives does not negate the calling. But at times, the storm can be a distraction from the process of still going over. Yes, okay. He said, oh, sir, Reverend, uh, I just want you to know that um, we here at the agency, we do everything in our power to keep families together. Would you be interested in his sister as well? Well, the first child is 14-year-old boy. The second child is a 16-year-old girl. 14 <laughs> and 16. If there's anybody in this world that should be taking care of the fatherless and the widows, it should be the church. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Oh, wonderful, Reverend. Oh, this is the, and then we're going to start in a week or so and so forth and so on. And I said, okay. My wife is a registered nurse. I didn't say a word to her yet. <laughs> She's at work. And so I get off the phone. Then I call the hospital where she works. Hello, hello, dear. You wouldn't believe what happened today. <laughs> And thank God, she's a woman of God. She's like, oh, whatever the Lord is telling you to do, then so be it. And, and I was like, okay, great. And so I hang up the phone. And now get this, I hang up the phone. I go downstairs from my office. And I get to the sidewalk. And when I get to the sidewalk, I see this little guy, this little boy there. He's looking at me. And I'm looking at him. And he goes, well, so did you? Huh? And I go, what? He goes, well, did you, did you say? Did you, what did you say? Did you say yes? I said, what are you talking about? Did you get a call today? But what do you say? Now, see, this kid, his name was Pablo. And I know I, I know I shouldn't say this, and please forgive me, but I got to be honest. He was the worst kid in the youth group. 
he fought every Friday. And he took all comers. He didn't care how big you are. There's going to be a fight every Friday after a youth meeting because this is what Pablo does. He was a terror. In fact, let me tell you, when you pray before you start ministry, it was one of those prayers like, oh, and God, please don't let Pablo come today. <laughs> Pablo. Pablo. Did you, did, you, did, you, did you care? See, what happened, Pablo got kicked out of his group home. That previous week, he got kicked out of his group home and he was on the street. And one of our deacons saw him on the street, kind of recognized him as one of the kids that come and, and picked him up and brought him to the house. When he brought him to the house, he took him to church on Sunday and he was in the church service on Sunday when he heard, and if there's anybody in this world that should be taking care of the fatherless and the widow. So on Monday, he went to his agency and told the caseworker, listen, I think I found somebody who'll take me. Come, let us go over to the other side. I said, what? He said, so what did you say? What did you say? I said, uh, I said yes. He said, yes. Oh, great. Uh, I'm going to tell my sister. I said, wait. You have a sister? Because I know him as Pablo. The person on the phone said, Christopher, Sweden. I don't know Christopher. I don't know Pop. He said, yeah, my sister's in there. And he, when he went inside, his sister was actually working in the nursery with some of our kids. I didn't even, I don't know her name because she's so quiet. But because of how she is, she, you know, it's like predators would come to her. And just if they need to get a, a quick feel or just do, they, they would always try to get to her. And so as a pastor and just as an older person, I said, yeah, get away, get away. This is my angel. And so for like easy six to eight months, I'm just calling her my angel. I don't know her name because she doesn't speak. She doesn't engage. Age, but I know she needs protecting, and it's his sister, Christina. And he says, he said yes. She goes, and she starts to smile. I go, whoa. I didn't even finish the eight-week course because I had to move in. I had to move her out as an emergency because where she was staying, where she was staying, they were dealing drugs already on the first floor, and guys would come up and just abuse her. She was being raped by her dad ever since she was five years old. And whenever they couldn't pay rent, he'd just send her to the landlord. That was her thought of men. And she was so happy when her father died when she was 10 years old. And her younger brother is always angry with her because he doesn't remember his father like that. And so here I take her into my house and all she's doing is waiting for me to come into the room now but I'm her dad. At the same time, my wife gets a phone call from Jamaica. One of her cousins or nephews, uh, she, he's, he's in conflict with, with, with his dad, and, and, and because of the conflict, he tried to kill his dad with a butcher knife. And so since he was already born in America and Florida, they want to bring him back to America so he could be emancipated from his father, but he needs a place to stay. Trust me, just like I heard from the Lord and told her something happened today, the same thing happened to her. I said, by the way, Chris, something happened today. <laughs> and so all within 30 days, all within a month, I get my son who's a fighter. And let me tell you, a gang, he's between Crips and Bloods. I've never heard that before. I didn't know you could be in between. Crips and Bloods. I have a, a daughter who's been uh, molested all her life, and now she's trying to deal with stuff. And now I have a, a, a guy coming from Jamaica who likes butcher knives. <laughs> and they're all coming here. Chris, come. I'm going to take you to the other side. In the midst of losing all, in the midst of this, two, three months later, my wife is pregnant. The empty house I had in Brooklyn, 14-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, and now a newborn. It's amazing. I didn't realize the storm. I thought all these years that the storm was designed so that I can learn from Jesus. And so I could say, Jesus, stop this storm. But I don't get that because Jesus had no intentions of waking up. He was taking a nap. 
And for years, I'd preach this sermon in a different way. I would say, our job is to wake him up so he can stop the storms in our lives. Or at the very least, as spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-filled men and women of God, we look at his example so we can stop our own storm. But what if the storm is not meant to be stopped? Because when Jesus rebuked the wind and spoke to the waters, he looked at them and he didn't apologize. If he apologized, then that type of theology would make sense. Guys, my bad. It was a long day of ministry. I dozed off. I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear the yelling and screaming. I'm sorry. Listen, guys, just do this. I'm, I'm, he didn't. Instead, he said, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? Where's your faith? Which is powerful. I said to myself, why? Can you imagine? Let me ask you this question, and, and the praise and worship team can come come up. Listen, what would have happened if the disciples didn't wake Jesus up? Think about that for a moment. What would have happened if, what would have happened if the disciples didn't shake him and wake him up? Do you think Jesus would have drowned? If they didn't wake Jesus up, let me ask you this. Do you really think he would have let the boat sink? He said, where is your faith? And for years I preached, I need the faith, Lord, to stop the storm. But what if your faith is not to have supernatural power to stop nature? What if the faith that he's saying, do you have the faith to embrace my grace? Because if you see Jesus sleeping... Do you have the faith to snuggle up right next to him? Because your confidence says, if he ain't worried about it, then I'm not going to be worried about it. Years later, my, my son and my daughter, they both became Marines, you know. My son served in Iraq for two years. My daughter, Tina, she's also a Marine. Try to mess with her now. <laughs> Let me tell you, I've seen my girl in action. She, she actually scored higher on the marksman test than my son did. She's pretty handy. She owns her own business now in Queens. My granddad, my son, he's a financial manager. Just moved him down to Atlanta a couple months ago, opened up an office down there. Incredible. But you know, he came back from Iraq with a severe case of PTSD. He was red flagged. When he came back from, from Iraq, I was the one responsible to wake him up because it'd be too dangerous for someone else to do it. He'd wake up in a fury. And just, it was a dark period of his life and he started rebelling in ways that was just crazy. And he was with someone, and, and, and she, she was pregnant. And then she lost the child. I've never seen my son so broken. And I recognized those tears. I recognized the words that he was sharing. I recognized the things that he was saying. He, he Pop, why, why is this happening to me? Is God punishing me because of what I did in Iraq? Because a lot of it had to deal with stuff that he had to do. Is, 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 is God punishing me because I'm not walking with him the way? What kind, why would God do that? Why would God take my child? Why? Why? What kind of? And I remember those same questions were the same questions I was asking. Come, let's go to the other side. Well, check this out. While, while I'm there, and I, I hold his hand. I can feel the Spirit of God speak to me. And listen, listen to what God was sharing with me. He says, Chris, um, if your child lived, you would never agreed to take Pablo and Tina. Never. And, he, and the Lord was right. The Spirit of God was right. Because the one, one of the things I wanted the most was to have a child of my own. And, 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 and he was right. And so I was able to grab my son's hand. And I'm, I'm not making this up. He, he got red flagged, extreme PTSD. He went to the VA hospital. It turned the tables over. It needed to be restrained. I grabbed his hand and I said, son, in Ephesians, it says, 
all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. And I said to him, I want to share with you that if my baby didn't die, I would never have been able to have the opportunity to love you and your sister. And as much as I would have wanted my child, God knew better. He was thinking of you and your sister. Then the tears started to fall with my son. Have you ever seen a Marine cry? Can I be honest with you? He never had another PTSD episode. Recommitted his life to the Lord. And just everything, God just took it. All things work together. The storm that you're in right now, it's hard to comprehend the wind and the waves. It's hard to comprehend the waters falling in. But listen, if Jesus is in the boat, it's going to be all right. I've learned. If Jesus has a pillow, then I'm looking for mine. If Jesus is sleeping in the midst of all this chaos, then I'm looking forward to snuggling up right next to him. Because my faith is attached to his unmerited favor. So yeah, my name is Chris. My wife's name is Chris, Christabel. My oldest daughter is Christina. My son is Christopher. My youngest daughter is Christiana. My youngest son is Christopher Jr. Chris, 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 and Chris. I had no idea that this pain would bring birth to life. So bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this opportunity because, Lord, there are things we go through, there are things that we experience, and I had no idea, God, that the same experience of not being able to love that brought me on this journey to go to the other side was the exact lesson I learned when I embraced my children because of the storm. Lord, I pray, oh God, that even in this room, that those of us who are experiencing storms right now, we're so busy trying to get the water out the boat that we don't recognize that Jesus is sleeping. I pray, oh God, that our faith in you, knowing that you won't let us go, you won't let us down, but all things work together for good to them that love you and who are called according to your purpose. Lord, embrace your children today. Let us feel your comfort and safety in the midst of all the chaos. In Jesus' name, amen.